one of the things that I think is very important for you to understand tonight is without the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, you are not capable of making it through this ministry time in this church or in any spirit-filled church without having to make the decision to either follow Christ, taking that step of baptism in the Holy Spirit, and you can say, well, I'll just sit back here and enjoy watching other people be filled with the Holy Spirit. You'll never make it. Don't be offended, please. I love you enough to tell you, if you don't have supernatural power in your life today, the supernatural power of hell will come against you, and you cannot stand. You need that. And I'll show you in the scriptures the difference. One, one of the scriptures that really stands out to me, or two of the scriptures that really stand out to me, come from uh, the New Testament book of Romans and of John. I'd like to read them for you right quick. This one, uh, I'm kind of like our brother Paul Goff. I don't have my other glasses on. I have to wear these because the lights are a little bright for me. This comes from John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, say received him. Receive. For as many as received him, to them gave he power to become. Say power to become. Power to become. The sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. To them that believed on his name. He gave them power to become sons of God. I'm going to put it this way. I've been to churches with people by the hundreds that are very becoming Christians, but they're not Christians that have the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. You can be coming a lot of things, but it doesn't mean you are. You ever heard the qualifying race at the Indy 500? Who's your competition? Yourself. Because if you can't qualify, you can't run the race. It's the qualifying race. And if you don't qualify, you cannot run the race. So how do we be what this scripture says we have power to become? You say, well, I, I'm going to go down here like tonight after church. I go get a ticket and I get on the airplane. And I go to Dallas. I can stand there with that ticket and say, boy, it sure is nice to be in Dallas. And the agent in Alaska and Airlines say, no, sir, you're, you're in Anchorage. No, no, no. I got a ticket. I'm in Dallas. No, sir. You're in Anchorage. You have a ticket to be there, but you're not there. You're in Anchorage. No, no, no. That ticket I bought, paid for, it says I, I, I go to Dallas, and, and, and I'm in Dallas because I got the ticket. No, sir, you're not in Dallas. You're insane. <laughs> Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way is the privilege to be there. The truth is the life you live to get there. And, and then you have Christ, which is the fullness of all that activity of faith steps taken through believing in who he is and believing in, in his name qualifies you. How do you be what he gave you power to become? You look at Romans and let me get my scriptures going again here in the book of Romans. But as many as received him, uh, pardon me, that's, it's the same exact beginning, but as many as are led by the Spirit of God, this is Romans chapter <laughs> so 8 and uh, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are, say are, are. not power to become, they are. They are being what they had power to become. They are the sons of God. How do you be what you have power to become? Power to become is the entrance at the cross. Power to be is the entering of the Holy Spirit into your life. And I'll show you the difference. When Peter was with, and the disciples were with Jesus in the Bible, it says he breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Did you know that word breathe is the same word that's used when the Bible says that God breathed the spirit into Adam. It's the same word, puffed. It's a puff. It's a breath of life breathed into Adam, and he became a living soul. When Jesus had received the Holy Ghost, they became a living church. What's the difference? Remember Simon Peter? Oh, though all forsake you, Lord Jesus, yet will not I, but the job of a servant girl and the crowing of a rooster which is about as low on the food chain as you can get. He denied Christ three times, cursed him. And though he said he would not do it, he did it because he wasn't the man he thought it was. And I shared that last night at Eagle River. And by the way, Eagle River, if you're some of you here tonight, thanks for a great evening last night. I enjoyed you and it was a joy to be back with there. I, I do miss being with pastors each time I get to come here. <sighs> 
One of these days, I'm going to get to meet pastor from this church. <laughs> I don't know how, but one of these days I'm going to meet that guy. And I, you do have a pastor, right? <laughs> kind of like Jerry Brown years ago. He was governor of California. He loved TV cameras. And one of the reporters asked him, uh, Governor, whenever the cameras go away, do you cease to exist? <laughs> I want to ask Pastor, when I come to Wasilla, do you cease to exist? <laughs> They're gone every time. I'll catch them here one of these days. But you've got to understand that Peter was not the man he thought he was and failed in every attempt to do what was right. But after the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God fell on them in that upper room, the same guy that could not stand in the presence and under, under the scrutiny of a, of a little maiden, a, a little girl accused him of being a, a follower of Christ, and he cursed Jesus to prove he wasn't. It's amazing how cursing really does separate you out of the family of God. Cursing really is a good way to prove you're not part of the family of God. When you curse people, no, oh, he's not a Christian. You, they know then you're not. Because it really did convince that little girl that he was not the follower of Jesus she accused him to be. And when he cursed, you ever talk about somebody and they walk up on you? Isn't that embarrassing? How un instantly the weather becomes the subject of the conversation? He turned around and Jesus was standing right there in earshot, in eyesight, listening and saw everything that Peter just said and did. And the Bible says that Peter went over and sat down on the porch and wept bitter tears, dripping through his fingers because he realized he was not the man he thought he was. He was a follower of Jesus. They would have said, I mean, even though he denied it, yet he was a follower of Christ. But he was missing something that would give him the power to be what he had not yet had power to be. He had power to become, but he was a very becoming Christian. And when Jesus breathed on him and said, Receive the Holy Ghost, the church was born. And on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God came into them and they spoke with other tongues. And Peter got up and preached, and 3,000 got saved that day. 3,000 were added to the church. Now you tell me the power of the Holy Spirit is not really necessary in our lives. Just be a follower of Christ and you're good enough. I was never raised to believe good enough is good enough. I was never to raised to believe that okay is okay. I was never believed, raised to believe that natural was okay when you can have the supernatural. Are you with me? I'm not saying if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you're not going to heaven. I'm going to say this. Following Jesus Christ will naturally take you to the next step of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Whenever you come to Christ, the Spirit of God baptizes you into the body of Christ. But when you're baptized in the body of Christ, Jesus baptizes you in the Holy Ghost. Amen. I hope you're listening. Because one day I found out the desperate need I had for extreme power. That without that power, I did not have the strength in myself to be what God gave me the power to become. And unfortunately, in my case... It was a very desperate situation. Many of you know the story, but I'm going to share it for some of it for those of you that I've not yet met because I want to give glory to God because Dave Reaver couldn't do it on his own. I'm the guy that was the hero that played ninth grade football. It hurt so bad, one down. I quit and joined the band and watched other kids get hurt. <laughs> Why should I suffer when I can watch and pay for somebody else to get hurt? I don't like pain. I'm not a masochist. I don't want to hurt myself. I don't want to hurt other people. I'm a little preacher. She grew up to love everybody and thought everybody loved me until some guy shot a rocket at me, tried to kill me in Vietnam. And then I found out that that natural instinct of self-survival kicked in, and I fought for my life, if not for my country. I fought for my life. And I can tell you today, everything that I ever grew up to believe, and I grew up to believe a lot, I grew up in the household of faith, Born to a woman that couldn't even feed me whenever I was born. She almost died, never did recover. And at the end of her long non-recovery, she died. After many years of being in a nursing home, curled up in a fetal position, 68 pounds, fed through a tube. Couldn't even feed me when I was born. I was raised by a Mexican nanny, Maria Rubio. I tell it everywhere I go. I was, my first language was Spanish. I didn't learn English until I was six years old, and they told me I wasn't a Mexican. <laughs> and they had to tell me because I thought I was. And like Peter, I found out it wasn't what I thought I was. 
which was an initiation process for me because many more times later on, as I shared last night at Eagle River, and I'm not going to repeat that whole message, but I want to repeat the, some of the essence of it because if we do not have the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we do not have the resources in and of ourselves to stand against the winds that blow of trials, suffering, desperation, and all that goes in being a successful, victorious Christian. You need the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Can I say that any better? I don't know how to say it again without you. I don't, I don't think anybody's going to miss the point. And that day on the bank of a river in Vietnam, once again, I found out I wasn't the man I thought I was because I really did think I was invincible. And though I had lost my passion and desire to live, as I shared the other night, in a village called Tutua, when I counted the dead among the children and the little teacher of the elementary school, all dead, and I felt like it might have been my fault because I brought the war to a village I didn't know I was bringing the war to. And I had a hard time getting over that to the point that I wanted to die without killing myself. So I put myself in very desperate, dangerous situations, hoping that the Viet Cong would kill me. Suicide by cop, you've heard that term? I wanted suicide by Viet Cong. I didn't want to kill myself, but I didn't want to live. Because something had happened to the soul of Dave Reaver that would one day happen to his body. It was so damaged and scarred, it could never be the same again. I will never be the same again because of war. I hate war, and I want everybody in this room to make no mistake, I hate war, but I love freedom just a little bit more than I hate war, enough to fight for that freedom at any cost to preserve it for myself, my family, my children, and children's children, your children, you and your children's children. I believe in freedom. I have no apologies to make for serving my country. Does everybody get that? And I want every military-minded person in this room, especially our active duty and retired military personnel, but those of you that are family members and you have military in your history and in your family, I want to tell you, thank you for what you've given to our country for our freedom tonight to be in this room. Thank you beyond words. Thank you. So what we fall into the trap of, if we're not going to be all God wants us to be, we want God to be all that we want him to be. And in doing so, we recreate a God in our own likeness. And if you look in the mirror and you say, I'm a self-made man, then you're worshiping your creator. Did you hear what I just said? If you're a self-made man, you're worshiping your own creator. And that's called humanism. You're worshiping yourself. You're your own creator, self-made. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I'm not going to follow you as my God. I can tell you that. I don't want your spirit in me. But there is a God that is a creator that made man and woman and viva la difference. And God made us to be different, and he made us to be one. How can we be different and still be like him? The Bible says we are the reflection of him made in his image how can we be in like him if male and female are different he's not talking about gender he's not talking about flesh he's talking about body soul and spirit and in order of priority spirit soul and body a trinity man created in the trinity likeness of a trinity god everything that exists reflects god except one thing and one thing only the only thing that is not Trinity, I'll get to. But if you think of it a moment, the chair you're sitting in reflects God. It's height, width, and depth. Trinity. You say, well, uh, what about time? Past, present, future. Well, what about the atom? Electron, proton, neutron. Everything that exists exists in Trinity except one thing. What do you think that is? Mankind born, not created. God created Adam and Eve in his image. He breathed life into them. They became a living spirit. And because he breathed life into Adam and became a trinity, he was created in the trinity, in the three part, the three standard cord, not easily broken. But you and I were not created by God. You say, whoa, brother Dave. No, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. You were made by your parents. Let me say it again. There's a difference of being made and being created. 
when they were created, they were in the image of God. But the Bible says the children of Adam were born in the likeness of their father, Adam, not God. They were born in body and soul, but they were born spiritually dead. They were born a duet when they were supposed to be a three-part harmony. I'm not making this up, folks. You just read your Bible and discover the truth of what I'm telling you. When you were born, you were born less than what God intended you to be. The only person ever born that was born in all three was Jesus Christ himself. Think about what I'm telling you. And if we have the trinity of the spirit of God in us, we are made spiritually living creatures, living spiritually, not dead spiritually, then we're in the likeness of the creation. It takes God to be a man. Let me say it again. It takes God to be a man. Jesus said, Father, make them like us, thou in me and I in them. Jesus put God back in man and made us the trinity we should have been from creation. And to be redeemed is to have our spirit born again. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be. It's not a suggestion. It is a reality of commandment. You must be born again. And to be born again is to believe in Christ and become what he intended you to be at the very beginning. And to do that, it is the full process of the, quote, full gospel of Jesus Christ. Why do you have Holy Ghost night on Wednesday night? Because somebody around here believes you're supposed to be filled with the Spirit of God and be all that you can be in Christ. I hear all the time, let, let's, let's let God be all, that, let's be all that we can be in Christ. And I wonder what it would do to us if we got the image of what it would be for us to have Christ be all he can be in us instead of all we can be in him. Let's let him be all he can be. I, I know it sounds the same. It is the same in a degree. But it just comes off different when we say, let Christ be all he can be in us. And does that make any sense? Yeah. Some of you look a little baffled. I, don't, I feel like a muffler sometimes myself. I'm so baffled. But I do tell you, and I mean this on my heart, folks, this is truth from the scriptures. And if we're going to succeed in this world today, you will not make it without the power of the Holy Spirit. Think a moment about the innate nature of mankind that has a passion and a desire for the supernatural. And if you think that is not true, you tell me why the world produces movies, no end of all the supernatural powers of creatures that fly. I mentioned, just touched on it the other night. Why is there this innate passion for some kind of worship of a God of supernatural power? Because God has a God-shaped hole in us that only he can fill. And we are stuffing everything in this planet down in that hole, trying to make it look like God because we're still trying to make him in our own image. We are not an idol factory, my friend. Let's let God make us in his likeness instead of us trying to make us in his likeness, instead of making him in our likeness. Do I have an amen? Clap your hands. Give me a little support in the house. So in my walk with Christ from the time I was a child, I recall very, very strongly my influence to be born again and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I was baptized in the Holy Spirit at the age of 16. 17 years, one year later at 17 years old, I held my first revival, started preaching the gospel at 17. I can't promise you that a lot of people got saved, probably more backslid than got saved in my meetings. But at least I had a start. I had to start somewhere. And this is the big lie I hear from so many people. Oh, I would serve him. I would minister if I just knew what he wanted me to do. I have the will of God for you. Every last breathing one of you with ears to hear, hear me. I will give you the will of God for your life. I will give you the call of God for your life. You ready? Are you ready? So today your excuses are gone. I just wish I knew what he wanted me to do. I'm going to tell you what he wants you to do. Are you ready? Yes. Preach the gospel and do so that none should perish but all come to repentance. Do the Jesus stuff. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit those that are in prison. Pray for the sick and they'll recover. Lay hands on them. They'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Do these things that are signs of the believer that follow them. This is simple, folks. 
you don't have to crawl around the altar begging God to give you wisdom of what the call of God is. Go win the lost. That is the call of God. And you say, well, can you be more specific? I will be. I'll be specific. If you see the need, you're called to be the answer to it. Last night at Eagle River, I really felt the Lord do something. I, I, and, and this is really interesting to me. When I come to Alaska to the King's chapels and to Maui to King's Cathedral and, and to different uh, chapels around the nation, when I go to these chapels, I have discovered there is a DNA that flows through every one of them. You know what it is? It's Holy Ghost power. It's old-time Pentecost that you don't find in churches anywhere anymore hardly. And I, it really breaks my heart. And as a Vietnam veteran, I want to tell you, I grew up in the very thing that I see taking place around this altar tonight already. I saw people saying the Spirit. I remember they used to tuck me under the front pew as a little baby so I wouldn't get a high heel through the eye socket. <laughs> Didn't bother me. I always came out with a mouth full of gum. <laughs> Rainbow flavor, a <laughs> little bit of everything. Let me tell you something, folks. I grew up knowing the power of the Spirit of God. And one day on the bank of a river in Vietnam on July the 26th, 1969, if I had not had that Spirit of Christ in me, I would never have survived a hand grenade. God's bigger than a hand grenade. He's bigger than a hand grenade. Oh, do I have information for you? Let me check. Oh, he's bigger than divorce. He's bigger than cancer. He's bigger than jail time. He's bigger than anything you've ever faced in your life, but you'll never know without that spirit of God in you that makes you a special operator in the special forces of the army of God Almighty. Don't settle to be a, don't settle to be a water boy. Be a machine gunner. <laughs> Do something big for God. And I keep going back to the things I said last night. And it wasn't my intention when I was preparing for today because I spent several hours with God before God for this service tonight. Because I really feel like I wanted to encourage you in the direction you're going to fan the flames and move you forward in this thing. Because, folks, I really believe this church is under attack. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a word from the Lord. You are under a severe major attack because you are a severe major threat to the enemy. He will never attack an enemy that is in his camp. If he's captured you, why should he fight to get you? It goes, it goes to that new facility up on the hill. When I came into town, we, we landed at Anchorage and drove out to Wasilla. And as we were coming into town, I looked up and I told my driver, I said, Justin, there's a church on the hill. It's a light. It's a lighthouse to this entire community. But you're more than that. When they said, can anything come, good come out of Judea? Can anything good come out of Bethlehem? Can anything good come out of of, can Jesus come out of the ranks of the normal? Well, he, was, he came out of the ranks of humanity. you got to remember, he's as much man as he is God. Amen? Amen? He's as much a human as he was. He had learned obedience. He learned obedience through the things he suffered. And suffering toughens us up. It does. Scar tissue is amazing stuff. Did you know that? It's amazing. Uh, it's very non-elastic. That means it doesn't, it doesn't have much elasticity. It's hard to, it's hard to stretch. I can, watch this. If I can get my arm back there, I can move my arm and look, it's going to move my chin. See that? You know why? It's solid scar tissue. I am nothing but a bundle of scar tissue. As I said the other day, I can show you, but then I have to kill you. I don't want to do that, so I'm not going to show you. What am I telling you? Scar tissue does not compromise. It doesn't stretch good. There's some things that scar tissue is not favorable, and that's one of them, except that it is also very, very tough. 
It's tougher than skin that's never been burned or hurt. Do you know that? So we're stronger in the broken places. A welder will tell you if a piece of steel breaks, he can weld it back and it's stronger where it was welded than before where it was welded. Than before it was welded. And so scar tissue is another thing. It's evidence. And it's evidence of three things. Evidence you got hurt. It's evidence you got over it. And it's evidence of empathy. But you don't get any of that without the battle. The battle scarred. And if scars are something to be ashamed of, tell me why Jesus kept his throughout eternity. John saw him as a lamb slain. How do you know as a lamb slain? Because he saw the scars that were still there from the, the suffering Jesus went through for our sake. Are you listening to me? We don't want to get in the fight. We don't want in the battle. We want to live an easy life. And it never ceases to amaze me the times I hear it. And I'm repeating some of the things I've said because I don't want you to forget it. We do not overcome the devil by the word of the lamb and the blood of the, blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. That is not true. And you're sitting there looking at me, yes, it is. No, it's not. And I'll challenge you right now and I'll prove it to you. There's another element that without it, the other two are meaningless. We overcome, we overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb. Say it, blood of the lamb. Word of our testimony, and we love not our lives unto death. How many times do you ever hear that? People don't want to say it. And it's, it's a habit we get into, and I'm not being critical of anybody that doesn't say that, except please, for heaven's sake, please, for heaven's sake, please remember. You can plead the blood. You can do all the... Condemn him in the name, condemn the devil in the name of Jesus. But if you don't submit yourself to God, resisting the devil is a waste of time. Right. And the submission to God is to not love your life even unto death. Finders, weepers, losers, keepers. Say it with me. Finders, weepers. Say it again. Finders, weepers, losers, Keepers, be a loser for Jesus. Because if you seek to save this life, finders, weepers, you lose it. But if for his sake you lose it, you keep it, losers, keepers, unto life eternal. So let's don't go through what we have left of our days from this moment till the grave or the sound of a trumpet. Let's don't go through these next years of our lives or days or even minutes, whatever it is, trying to be a winner. Let's be a loser. Because if I win my life, I've lost it. But if I lose my life, I win it. I am saying to you, let's get in the battle and let's get off of our own throne and get onto God's throne. Let's put ourselves in the position of victory. And that's done through the power of the Holy Ghost in your life. If ever. You know, I remember Donald Rumsfeld. Remember him? Anybody remember Donald Rumsfeld? Secretary of, of uh, Defense. Uh, he's a wonderful man. He really, I really liked him a lot. I don't know if he's mistakes. I don't know that. I just, he had a great personality. And at the beginning of the Gulf War, when things were going well, before we decided that we wanted party differences to destroy the works of our soldiers and their sacrifice for party differences, may God have mercy on the murders in politics. We never have lost a war on the battlefield. We always lose it in the halls of Congress. Make no mistake. And I want to tell you, Donald Rumsfeld was the darling of the media at the beginning, and they loved him. Everything he said was wonderful. And one day they were complimenting him, and this is what he said. Remember, my friends, he said, the farther up the ladder the monkey goes, the more of the behind the monkey shows. Boy, I love the way you guys listen. You don't miss a word I say. And it really scares me because I got I to gotta say it right because I don't want you to take anything I say if it's wrong. I want you to take it if I say it right. You see, when we're high and lifted up, we show our backside. Even the priests were given commandments from God. Do not wear a gown or skirt and go up the ladder to the top of the altar to make a sacrifice because somebody's going to look like your skirt. That's exactly what he told them. Did you know that? He told them, don't you wear a skirt and go up the ladder. Somebody's going to look at your behind. Well, the higher we lift ourselves, the more of our behind show. Let's lift him up and let him be glorified. He said, if I lift it up, I'll draw all men unto me.
Come on, let's give God a praise offering. <laughs> Hallelujah. If we keep ourselves off the throne, if we let him be God and we let God be God, he's the great I am. Not the great I was or the great I used to be or the great I wish. The great I wish. He's the great I am. There is no greater than the great I am. And if we keep him on the throne, it's like Isaiah said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up on his throne. The old man, the old man king has to die before the great king himself can sit on the throne. You see, when we destroy the works of the flesh, we have destroyed the golden calf. We've destroyed the images that we've tried to make God look like that we made ourselves with our hands, trying to fashion a God in our likeness so that we don't have to answer to him. It's no different than judges who make rules. They're supposed to interpret the law, not make the law. And the fact is many a judge has made laws to fit his failures. So he will never condemn that drunk driver and he'll never condemn that murder. That's why we have liberal prosecutors today that are saying, oh, let them go free because if they were to condemn them they would condemn themselves if they cast a stone at the woman that was the adulteress they would cast the stone on themselves and kill themselves with their own stones are you listening to me we will always condemn those that have sinned the sins that we don't want to be guilty of ourselves but we will never condemn those that commit the sins that we condemn ourselves with if we condemn them and it is not my place I'm not going to mention the man's name that I'm going to refer to one of the greatest men I've ever known and love him dearly to this day but I remember the day that there was a great fall and a, a, a moral issue that just virtually destroyed everything he had ever built and I wrote him a letter and I said dear I'll say sir dear sir I can never forgive you for what you've done how can I forgive who I do not condemn, and how can I condemn who I do not judge, and how do I judge lest I be judged? I love you and look forward to our relationship in the future, and today he's one of my best friends this day, and his ministry is huge and successful today because I could have burned that bridge with self-righteous condemnation, lifting myself up bigger than someone else to allow myself to, be, to look good. If I'm lifted up, the behind will show. Ladies and gentlemen, let's not judge. Let's not condemn our brothers and sisters to hell. Let's encourage one another. Be good special operators in the special forces of the kingdom army, the angel army that God has. Let's be good warriors. It's been said that God's army is the only one that kills its wounded. Let's not be guilty of that. Amen? Amen. If I'm going to take out somebody, I want to take out my enemy not my fellow soldier, my fellow warrior. So always, and if you're in a ministry, a little word of advice, and I believe it's good character, if you can't support another ministry, don't expect anybody to support yours. If you can't speak well of another ministry, don't expect anybody to speak well of your ministry. If you're not willing to be servant to somebody else's ministry, don't be surprised when you have nobody willing to serve in your ministry. You will only receive what you're willing to give out. Amen. Amen. So today, I have the great joy of crawling off that boat into the water, burning with white phosphorus, my skin floating everywhere around me. I was literally beside myself. <laughs> Did you get it? I needed to pull myself together. I got a few other one-liners too. I'll be careful, though. My time's up. I'm actually a few minutes over. So to conclude this evening, I'm going to say this very, very carefully. Last night, the invitation was to the young people, and they lined up across the entire front of that church, so many young people in Eagle River. You know why? They have a filter. They have a sift that gets rid of the old folks. It's that long stairway that goes to the top of that <laughs> building. Only young people can make it to the top. I do love that church, but I can't wait for them to get a ground-level sanctuary. <laughs> that church is filled with young people, and it was so beautiful. They lined up, 
And last night, they made a personal promise and vow to me that they would seek out training and instruction and discipleship leadership in their lives so that they, as they enter into, ultimately, if not already, some of them, into secular university campuses, they will have the tools in their toolbox necessary to withstand the lies and the deceitfulness that will come out, spewed out of the mouth of do and doctrines of devils out of the mouths of those that are being used by hell itself in giving these children, our children, our kids, lies that will contradict everything I've tried to tell you tonight about the Holy Spirit, about salvation, about following Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you, folks, we have the last generation in our classrooms without a breakthrough. We cannot ask God for a revival. How do you revive, which is live again, that's what revive means. How can you revive if you never revived? If these children have never known the life in the spirit, how can they relive or be brought back to something they never had? So we don't need a revival. We need a spiritual awakening, a birthing of new life. And if we're going to say, God, let's, let's have a revival, let it be among those of us older folks, like some of you looking at me right now saying, don't you call me that. Yes, you are. You have a disease called age. And some of you, not me, some of you have symptoms that are already showing. I got to go. Can I get a promise that you'll be praying for me? I got to know why Sella's praying for Dave. Thank you. And in return, I promise you, I'll be in prayer for you. And I can't wait to see you guys in October in your church. I won't get to be here because I'm scheduled. I don't have a Sunday off throughout the rest of this year except Christmas Day Sunday is the only one. And then January, I'm scheduling January and February on the rest of the year. is almost totally booked. I really need your prayers. I do not have a church in America that I think I could count on to break through in Holy Ghost intervention in prayer, intercession in prayer, greater than this church right here and Eagle River. I'm trusting you guys to be my prayer partners. Let me be sent by you, not went from you. I want to be sent by you. And I want to represent you wherever I go as your evangelist from Wasilla because I'm going to tell you, the day's coming, that church up on that hill We'll go to multiple services because you cannot contain the people that will be coming from all over life. They will fly in from Bethel. They'll fly in from Nome. They'll fly in on the weekends to come just to be in the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit at Wasilla. And that is a prophecy. You watch it come to pass. And it will spread from here like the winds that come out of Alaska that go all the way down to the lower 48, it'll cover the nation. You are the great hope of the Pentecostal outpouring of the last days. In the name of Jesus, I believe it. Amen. I'm Dave Reaver, and I approve of this message.